Hey, good morning. Just wanted to kind of touch bases. Haven't talked business in a long time, but I kind of wanted to give all the uh, followers and people that pop in and take a look at the videos kind of an update, uh, you know, during this COVID thing. And if this is the first time you've ever seen this video, I will kind of break it down for you. I've been involved, well, I'm retired military, but uh, I retired in 2001 and I've been involved in the, I guess you could say treasure market, <laughs> rare coins uh, and uh, bullion. I did that for, oh gosh, off and on for years, worked with some of the biggest, had my own company, worked with some of the biggest companies on the planet for that type of a thing. But at the same time, I've always been interested in other antiques and collectibles and and uh, rarities and artifacts and, and vintage and anything that you want to, or anything that you want to call it, but stuff that's old, <laughs> if you want to kind of break it down. But uh, anywhere from vintage clothing, this is 20 years or older, I really like old denim, you know, uh, old Levi's all the way back to the very beginning. Who doesn't like that? Artwork, paintings are big. Tiki culture, Aloha shirts. Uh, actually, when I, I actually first started in the collectibles, if you want to call it that, resale kind of business, back in the 90s, when I was living in Hawaii. I, I lived in Hawaii from 92 to 96, somewhere around in there, and, uh, or 93 to 96. I don't even remember anymore. I lived on Oahu, and I mean, I grew up in Southern California near the beach, so Aloha shirts, Hawaiian shirts were always kind of in my blood, because that's just what everybody wore, and, uh, my dad had like 40 of them. He still has 40 of them or so in his closet. And when I say Aloha shirt or Hawaiian shirts, I mean shirts that were actually made in Hawaii and designed by Hawaiian crafters, not this cheapy stuff that you see float around nowadays. I mean, there might be some exceptions. Tommy Bahamas are kind of nice. I don't think they're made in Hawaii, but that might be the only exception, even though I'm not really into that particular brand. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's kind of how I started in the whole collectibles game. And uh, got a series of books on it. You know, a great book, The Aloha Shirt by Dale Hope, which I highly recommend if you ever want to learn about it, if that's your thing, you know. But there's Aloha shirts that I have picked up in thrift stores in Hawaii back in the 90s that I probably paid, I don't know, $6 for, maybe as high as $12, that I've sold for $50 and $60. There's Aloha shirts that are worth five and 6000 believe it or not. Uh, usually it's the shirts that come from the 40s during World War II era that they called silkies that weren't really necessarily made of silk. They were made of rayon. And that is just kind of a nickname for the, those types of shirts, silkies. But Aloha shirts from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s are all very collectible. You know, in the 70s, you might get some of these crazy polyester kind of designs from like Liberty House and a few others. But anyway, I'm kind of getting off topic, but that's kind of where I started in the, in the whole collectibles market or business. Uh, so way before I retired from the military in 2001, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But, and then of course, when I retired, my first job after 2001 was with a precious metals rare coin company 
and I had always been interested in antiques and collectibles anyway. So along with me working for that company, I also had a space in a antique strip mall and did a little bit of everything and then eventually went in, uh, got into mid-century modern. And, uh, and then I ended up opening my own store called Atomic Cowboys, which was mid-century modern and vintage clothing. I was living outside of Houston at the time. And uh, eventually, after about 10 years uh, in, in Beaumont, Texas, I moved back out to California, spent another 10 years out there because I hadn't lived out there in like 37 years just traveling, living all over the world, really. And then after 10 years of watching California fall apart, as most of you who have been to California or have left can completely understand, I left California and came out back here to Texas. And... Uh, <coughs> moved to Keller. So Keller's just north of Dallas. Dallas and Fort Worth. So this is probably going to be my forever home unless I decide to all of a sudden move across the world again. Who knows? But for right now, I think this will be my forever home. I'm in a really cool loft apartment overlooking a town center. So I'm on the third floor and down on, on the bottom floor along the street level are shops and restaurants and it's just really cool. I enjoy it. I haven't bought here. I don't know if I will buy here. If I do, it'll be a little bit more out into the country where I could actually buy some property, you know, like three or four or five acres and have some outbuildings or maybe even a, a space that's duly zoned you know, some type of uh, situation like that. Who knows? And anyway, I, I kind of have this aspiration to open an art gallery. Uh, there is a lot of art around Dallas-Fort Worth to be had. And, uh, and art kind of wraps into the whole rare coins, uh, what you might call uh, luxury tangible assets. It, it all kind of flows together sports memorabilia, uh, rare comics, things that could be certified. But anyway, when I moved back out here, I intended to start my own company called Fort Worth Rarities, which was an extension of something I was doing out in California. Uh, which was uh, OC Treasure Hunters or Orange County Treasure Hunters. But things didn't exactly work out, especially with COVID and everything else. And so what I did is I found a really great brand new antique business and I offered to do all their online sales because they didn't have really much of an online presence. They had a little bit of a website built and they also had uh, a little Facebook page but they didn't really they hadn't really developed it much at all and the website was it was just terrible the hoster whatever it was I mean I couldn't couldn't even figure out how to get from one item to the it was just a bad website so not any hit on on my now business partners, but but the person that was helping them with it didn't know what they were doing. The hosting website was terrible. So we built them a little website on Shopify, started a, a good eBay store and a good Etsy shop. And, and of course they have their storefront now, their storefront is in a historical home in Grapevine, Texas. The home was built in 1910. It's commercially zoned, so it's part of the 
historical downtown district. And if you know anything about Grapevine, Texas, it's a great little town. And if you're from California, if you're from Orange County, you know what downtown Orange is like, or Orange Circle, where it has four spokes that goes off. <clears throat> well, imagine just one of those spokes a little bit longer, and that's downtown uh, Grapevine. Really, really neat, really unique. They say it's the Christmas capital of Texas. They did do a big, huge blowout where they closed the whole street down and have parades. And just, it, it's, it's like Main Street Disneyland on steroids. It really is. Or downtown Disney. Except with the, without all the expensive, you know, chain stores. But it's really, really great. It, Bonnie and Clyde had a shootout in that area. I mean, it just has tons of history. So if you ever do make your way to North Central Texas, come to Grapevine and check it out. And there's some great antique malls around the area here and there. Uh, but definitely come to Main Street Antiques and Uniques, which is just right off of Main Street. You'll find it. It's behind the farmer's market. But anyway, when I moved out here, and my idea kind of started falling apart because of COVID and being brand new to the area, and I had all the pieces of the pie together to start Fort Worth Rarities, but for various reasons, for personal reasons, personal relationship reasons, COVID-19, a dip in the economy, being new to the area, just a lot of things kind of made that not go as planned. But you know, if you're a serial entrepreneur like me, it's failure after failure after failure after failure. And, and you don't really call it a failure. You just call it a, a way. It's an experiment in learning how to not do something. And I've had some great, you know, successes I mean, there's been months I've had sales online and that, and I've made like 12 grand in a single deal. And then there's been months where I, I barely made a thousand bucks, you know. And if it wasn't for a military pension, I'd have really been hurting. But that's all part of being an entrepreneur. Uh, so anyway, I, I linked up with Main Street Antiques and Uniques and and then really when COVID hit in March they're like well they had three storage units they're like let's close the three storage units that were full of stuff that were overflowed from the store let's buy a, or, or rent a warehouse so they did that which I had suggested and really really concentrate on putting everything online which is what was my kind of my plan to begin with but since COVID hit and we had to close the store the actual storefront it gave all of us there were four of us time to work in the warehouse and allow me to really concentrate on eBay and Etsy okay so that was in March and this is October so that's seven months this is starting an eBay store from scratch, brand new. So, any of you who have ever started an eBay store understand that, you know, you, you can only list 10 things at the beginning and so forth and so on, and it takes a while before they raise your level, and it just takes a little bit to get an eBay store up and running. But what I did is they put me on their account as their eBay store manager. And I called and talked to some of the people there at eBay. And I explained to them that I had built and had many eBay stores and and gave them my IDs and they knew who they were, what they were, and told them that I would be building their store for them and managing it. And they really sped up the process 
I mean, now, and this is in seven months now, you know, we're able, able to list, I don't know, close to a million dollars worth of stuff. And I mean, <laughs> the amount of things we could list is, is kind of endless. But since I've been concentrating on the eBay store and on the Etsy shop for them, and we do Facebook Marketplace also, so that's another little outlet. I even throw stuff up on Depop. But, you know, Depop, very, very small, mostly clothing. I'm kind of using that more as a marketing tool. And I've built a nice Facebook page. But so in seven months, uh, it's averaged uh, five to six thousand a month in sales in seven months every month pretty much I mean it took a dip in the summer but if you average it out it's it's close to six thousand a month and it's been that since the very beginning and I mean I ramped it up like within the first month we were selling big ticket items and uh, if you average it out, you know, uh, price per item, now it's, it's kind of skewed because you would, you know, it's $75 per item is, is what the average is, which actually, I guess, would be, kind of, you know, pretty accurate if I think about it. But some of the bigger ticket items that, that we had listed was antique furniture. Now, obviously, it's very hard to ship antique furniture uh, so what I did with that is I just did local pickup only but if you would like to arrange for your own shipping company to come pick up the item we'll help you in that process and we suggested you ship so you ship is a great app if you don't know what you ship is look it up uh, I'm not getting anything from you, Shep, or anything, but a, a number of clients that wanted to buy furniture, but they couldn't come and pick it up, that's what they use. They use you, Shep. We had a nice big old piece of furniture go to Las Vegas. We had one go to New York and, and a few other places. So that's how some big ticket items got out the door. And then they had a lot of glassware in the uh, warehouse. Tons of it, really. A lot of vintage glassware, Vaseline, uranium glass, if you know what that is, milk glass, which I hate. Just put that out there. Uh, a lot of China, China sets, older stuff, all the way back to the turn of the century, 19... 1901, 1902, a lot of Murano mid-century stretch glass, uh, and just just a ton of glass and crystal in China, <coughs> which I don't particularly like. It's not it's not my thing, but I mean I like historical items and coins and comics and and all of that and military and. Hawaiiana and vintage clothing and vinyl. Old books. That's kind of my speed. But a good antique shop or business is going to have a little bit of everything. So, to date, we have over 2,500 things listed on eBay and about 1,200 things listed on Etsy. And kind of keep it at that level or, or make it, you know, go up or whatever. I mean, things sell. So, in seven months, we've sold just on eBay itself. Not from the shop, the, the brick and mortar, or on Etsy, but just on eBay. We've sold close to 500 items. And like I said, out of those 500 items... We produced 
five to six thousand a month on average for seven months and it breaks down to on average seventy five dollars per item that's not counting overhead so you can figure thirteen percent between eBay fees and PayPal which now we just signed up for the new eBay uh, finance processing thing the new whatever you call it I don't remember <laughs> but we just got on board with that we'll see what difference that makes but of course because believe it or not all this class has been doing really really well it's almost like we become a replacement you know they have replacements online everybody knows most people know what replacements is if they have a piece of grandma's china that's missing or got broke they could go on replacements and buy it usually we're talking older vintage discontinued china patterns all the way back you know uh, very early stuff actually But it's very expensive. I mean, if you want a, a, a gravy boat from 1920, <coughs> or Rogers Brothers, or whatever it is, you can't find one any place. You can always go to replacements, and more than likely they have one there, or they'll have it backlogged and be looking for it. But you're gonna pay for it. Some good money for them. So we've kind of, in a way, become, you know, amongst other things, a replacement kind of pieces. So we actually sell a lot of china and glassware and kitchen items and, and of course, uh, <coughs> mid-century modern glass and crystal, goblets, and, and just everything. Uh, and in a, kind of in a way, we become our own little replacement kind of uh, store, amongst other things. But but as much as I hate glassware in China and crystal and all of that, because it's just not what interests me personally. And I hate to walk into a, a nice antique shop and that's all they have. You're like, what? You know? It's done really, really well on eBay. Amongst the other things. And of course, mid-century modern. Mid-century modern always does does well. Whether it's like 1950s kitschy kind of things, <coughs> like salt pepper shakers or whatever. Or 1960s, uh, you know, uh, designer small furniture pieces or lamps. You know, atomic looking parchment shade lamps or funky uh, furniture or you know what have you and even into the 70s with Hollywood Regency kind of style and disco mod kind of era stuff that all still does very well and a lot of young people collect it and it's something I've really been hitting hard over the last couple months is vinyl vintage vinyl Everybody knows it's in collectibles now that <coughs> young people are infatuated with vinyl. And the typical 